Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Once again, thank you and uh, for joining us and taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us in these studies and uh, for uh, tuning in every week and telling your friends about us. Let me just say very quickly, we are uh, again uh, in probably somewhere around 100 programs that we have shot over the last couple of years on the book of Revelation that we have aired. This uh, is somewhere around 100, somewhere in that range of programs that we've shot. If you've missed any of them, to get the background, you can go back free of charge right now to YouTube and you can get the, uh, you can get the video uh, that we aired on these programs and watch them at your leisure. You can also go to iTunes and sign up for our podcast and have the audio of this downloaded to your iPhone or iPad or any of your devices. There's also an uh, RSS feed for your Android type device so that you can hear these things and study them at your leisure and you can go back and see how we have systematically over a hundred programs built to show why we believe what we believe. I believe you ought to be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within you and at least I think I've laid a pretty good trail of how we got to what we're sharing now. And uh, once again, uh, uh, those things are available to you to watch. Uh, also want to say thank you for your very kind words and letters on both our Facebook public profile page and uh, via the email and the phone calls. That is very encouraging to us. And for those of you who have uh, decided to become partners with us, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. If you've not considered becoming a partner and you appreciate what you're hearing, uh, please uh, consider becoming a partner today with our ministry with a monthly gift because that's what keeps us going. Uh, I want to get back in the Word uh, again today. Uh, we are at the sixth bowl or sixth vial being poured out in the book of Revelation. And what we have shown you is that these bowls or vials of wrath are in fulfillment of God keeping His end of the covenant bargain to Israel. And you, we see that all the plagues that are being poured out here in the book of Revelation are the same ones that are in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 28, to a people who would follow after other gods and that would apostatize from uh, the things of God. It is also the plagues of Egypt that God promised to them that if you uh, don't obey His word, keep His command, and, and walk in these things, that all the plagues of Egypt will come upon you. Now, one of the things we need to understand again, and one of the main reasons I started teaching this is because we need to understand uh, eschatology in light of covenantal realities. God acts certain ways under certain covenants. As you see, there, the, the, co the covenant with Abraham was a different kind of a covenant than the covenant that God had with the children of Israel under Moses. The covenant that God had with the children of Israel under Moses was, uh, it, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Uh, if you do this, then I'm going to do that. If you don't do this, then I'm going to do this. And so God was keeping his end of the covenant bargain of all the plagues that he promised them for not doing all the words of this law. Now let me say to you that under the new covenant, you and I have been redeemed from the curse of the law because we've received our Messiah and we've received the blood put on the doorpost of our houses and our lives so that none of these plagues come upon us. And even historically fulfilled, those who had received the blood of Jesus and knew him as their Messiah and listened to the words of the prophecy that he gave them in Matthew 24 and also in Luke, I believe it is chapter 21, that they fled when they saw Jerusalem encompassed with armies. They escaped all of these judgments and plagues that were poured out. And we went back and showed you how every one of these bowls and vials were historically and defensively fulfilled under the first century church, especially from about 65 A.D. to 70 A.D. Uh, we're going to go into the sixth vial today. This is chapter 12, uh, or this is verses 12 through 16 of uh, chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. It says, um, uh, it says, uh, and they, uh, this, this is verse 11, I'm sorry, uh, verse 11, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. 
I don't know how you'd have been, but I believe at about this point, I'd have been fine in some way, if it was at all possible, to repent. Because, I mean, it was not going to be anything but uh, relentlessly poured out upon them because these are filled up the wrath of God. They are the last plagues. And so verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up at the way, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The great river Euphrates, I'm going to read a lot of stuff from my notes in this segment because it helps me to just make it simpler and more concise and the research and the history is already here. The great river Euphrates is re represented in this bowl of judgment just like it was in the sixth trumpet. You can compare that to the sixth trumpet in the book of uh, Revelation. The drying up of the river was the strategy of Cyrus the Persian when uh, the conqueror of historical Babylon in 536 B.C. The river under him, under Cyrus, was diverted away from the walls of Babylon, and this allowed his army to march under the wall and overtake the city and his king Belshazzar without much resistance. Now, this is a historic account of how the river was re referred to. In my own research, I personally believe that Babylon, in the book of Revelation, Great Babylon, is the harlot city Jerusalem, and we will defend that in the next several segments. We will show you why we believe that Babylon was the great city who had become a harlot. It was God bringing an end uh, and divorcing this woman and marrying a new Jerusalem, if you will. An old Jerusalem was fading, and a new Jerusalem was coming. A harlot was being judged, and God was giving birth to a brand new bride. A marriage was about to take place a marriage that uh, was about to be consummated. And uh, I, so I personally see Babylon in Revelation as pointing to Jerusalem. And it's related to the destruction in A.D. 70. Uh, God helped his people, Israel, through the drying up of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. And, God, and, the river, and the river Jordan, God opened the river Jordan. It is ironic that God is now using the same type of judgment against Israel. So before, when God was on their side delivering them, he was opening Red Seas. He was opening the Jordan River for his people to cross over in protection from their enemies. And now God is allowing the river to be dried up so that he could give access to these enemies, just like Cyrus did when he came against physical Babylon in 536 B.C. The river dried up as part of the strategy. So uh, I think it's ironic that God now, using the same type of judgment against Israel, this new Babylon, Babylon, which is, was invaded, this new Babylon, which was invaded, if you will, not by Cyrus this time, but a new Cyrus, the Roman, the Roman hordes of armies, all the while miraculously saving the true covenant people. History tells us that this vision mirrors the return of Vespasian's armies, now led by his son Titus, bringing in reinforcements. And Josephus uh, writes that these reinforcements came from the region of the Euphrates in the east. That's not, that's not a coincidence. That's in fulfillment of what Revelation prophesied about. I tell you, when you see some of these things and you see how accurately God depicted, you know, I, I'm telling you, there's just, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff today that people are trying to make fit these eschatological end time events that are just, the players are just not in place. It is so twisted and mixed that it's not consistent. I think we're showing you a consistent view of the book of Revelation having been fulfilled. We'll report and you decide. I'm not trying to convince you. If you believe something totally different, that's your prerogative. I just happen to believe that this stuff is not in my future. It's in my past, and that's incredibly good news. I think what is in my future depends on what kind of a gospel we preach and whether or not we'll take the gospel of the kingdom and continue to see an increase around the world. I believe it is in our hands to see that happen. Uh, so... Uh, uh, he brought reinforcements, uh, and they came from the Euphrates. And the next verse says, And then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils. I think that when you see the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, you see the, tri the, 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 the trinity of the enemy where you see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being the trinity of God, this is the trinity of the enemy, the false prophet, the dragon, and the beast. 
For they are the spiritual devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Coming from the mouth of the devil, the dragon, were three unclean spirits like, draw, like frogs. This is a parallel to the second plague in Egypt in Exodus 8, verse 1 through 15. Natural Egypt was judged by natural frogs. And this time, spiritual Egypt is being judged by spiritual frogs. And I've already drawn the parallels to how I believe this is also speaking of a spiritual Egypt. So he's, he's connecting dots to all these things. Then he goes on to say, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. This is, I want to emphasize this. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk nakedness and they see his shame. In Revelation, the third chapter, that this is this verse in Revelation 16, blessed is he that keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and his shame appears, is almost a direct quote from Revelation 3, verse 1 through 6. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it goes on to say this, And under the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know your works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Watch this. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So these that are arrayed in white robes, he says to them, uh, again, he says to them, uh, blessed is he that keeps, watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and the shame uh, of his nakedness would appear and that he would come on them like a thief. Is the same words that he says to the church at Sardis. Remember, therefore, how thou hast heard and repent, or I will come on thee as a thief. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Hallelujah. Uh, I think it's powerful to me that he's telling them to watch and to keep their garments. One of the paradigms that we need to understand very clearly in the New Covenant is that the, that the white fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Uh, I probably have another note here somewhere uh, where it talks about that, but you probably already know that, that the, robe of righteous, the, the white robes is the righteousness of the saints. So when I think about New Covenant righteousness as compared to Old Covenant righteousness, the Old Covenant righteousness was based on your performance. Did you cross your T's, dot your I's? But in the New Covenant, righteousness is based on a gift. Because of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign in life. Hallelujah. That's a kingdom word. Uh, but the, in the new covenant, our righteousness is a gift. So when I think about guarding and keeping my garments, I'm simply talking about guarding and keeping and protecting what Jesus already did in his finished work and protecting this new covenant. And, uh, you know, the repentance that he's talking about into most of these churches, we've already dealt with in earlier segments, but the repentance doesn't simply mean we need to get saved again. It means we need to shift the way we think or have a change of thinking. And what these folks have done is shifted from an old covenant paradigm to a new covenant paradigm, they have repented and changed their mind. And so in the new covenant, we are watching and we are guarding and we are keeping uh, our garments white and we are protecting them uh, lest he come upon us like a thief. Because to those who did not protect this new covenant righteousness, but were still trying to operate under an old covenant righteousness, of course you know that their garments was filthy and therefore these judgments came upon them. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before God on the basis of my own work lest any man should boast. Matter of fact, the writer of the New Covenant, one of the things he says is that those who are under the works of the law are still under a curse. The only way you can curse people in the New Covenant is put them back up under the law. Here is a, a bunch of folks who he had offered redemption, whom he had offered them, uh, you know, to be clothed in white raiment, that the shame of their nakedness would not appear. He offered that to them, and they have forsaken that. And because of that, he said, I'll come on you like a thief, and you'll not know what hour I'll come upon. 
upon you. Uh, in uh, in uh, Revelation, the seventh chapter, verse 13 through 17, he says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these robes that, hallelujah, that we're wearing have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. And again, I submit to you that the revelation or that the tribulation that they are coming out, out of is not in your future. It occurred right here during this period of time when all of this tribulation is breaking out that Jesus said, then will be great tribulation. Such was not since the beginning of the world or would ever be again. And then Jesus prophesied that that would occur during that generation of his contemporaries. It goes on to say, uh, these are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Remember, in the book of Revelation chapter 16, they're scorched with the sun, they're scorched with heat. I mean, the, if you, listen, just, if you just take a concordance and start comparing spiritual things with spiritual things and go back and look at the same, uh, the same wording in other places, you can see how this fits like a glove because it's not what's coming, it's what has already happened. For the Lamb that's in the midst of the throne of them shall feed them, shall lead them to fountains of living waters. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Another reference to the white garments in Revelation 3, it says, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and to anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And so what I see happening here again is that he's telling them, I would, that, uh, that, uh, that you, you, you say you're rich, that thou mayest, he said, but you know, what he says in, in this, to this church in Revelation 3 is, uh, he says, because you say you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, but knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment. When you think you're rich, it's because you don't realize the spiritual deficit they were in. One of the things Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, introducing the kingdom in the Beatitudes, is you are blessed when you are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. To be poor in spirit does not mean you go around with the molly grubs or your head hung down. It simply means uh, that you realize that under an old covenant paradigm, see, everything Jesus is comparing is that under the old covenant, you're mourning. Under the old covenant, you're poor. Under the old covenant, you've got to be hungry for righteousness. In the new covenant, you've received a righteousness. In the new covenant, you're going to be fed if you've been hungry. You're going to be fed. In the new covenant, if you've been naked, you're about to be clothed. If you, uh, you know, if you think you're rich, uh, you need to be poor in spirit because uh, in, if you don't realize the spiritual deficit you are in, you will not be able to enter the kingdom because it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And that's not how much money you have in the bank. That's based on the fact that you think you got it all together on your own human performance and you think you got the goods. But I'm going to tell you where God is concerned, I am utterly and completely dependent upon him. And I am looking to him for my clothing, my redemption. And I thank him because my robe has been made washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we have the righteousness of the saints already on us. So uh, we, we've already bought this gold tried in the fire. We've already got on white raiment. And if we see a new covenant paradigm, our eyes have already been anointed with eye salve. Now verse 16, it goes on to talk about, I believe, something very powerful. We're going to switch gears here a little bit. He gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now this comes from author John Noe. Uh, who, if you remember right, had uh, I had him on my program back several months ago. John's got several books that's written. You go on Amazon.com and get any of John's uh, books. Uh, but this came from John Noe uh, from a website that I was reading from. It says, on the other hand, um, when it talks about uh, the Battle of Armageddon, author John Noe, on the other hand, notes that what the Bible refers to as a battle on the great day of God Almighty, Revelation 16 verse 14, would transpire at the place that in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. In Hebrew, it is actually Har, H-A-R, M-A-G-E-D-O-N, as Har, H-A-R, means mountain in Hebrew. So it's the mountain 
of Megiddo is a Greek rendering since H is silent in the Hebrew. Therefore, this battle was to take place primarily on a mountain and not in the valley is what John Noe adds. And so the most likely case is that the revelations, or is that revelations, H-A-R or mountain, that's what Har, Magdon, Har is Jerusalem because geographically Jerusalem sits on top of a mountain. So this great battle of Armageddon is fought on top of a mountain and is fought in the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, because to get from any direction, one must go up to Jerusalem. One must go up to the city of the great king. Uh, Jerusalem is also called God's holy mountain in Psalm 43, and the chief among the mountains, Isaiah 2, verse 2 and 3, also uh, Isaiah 14, verse 13. Uh, there's several uh, places where it's called that. Mega, M M Megiddo, or Megiddo <coughs> may also be a, a comparative imagery, a great slaughter, once took place in the valley of Megiddo in 2 Kings chapter 9 and in Zechariah chapter 12. Throughout ancient history, this valley was also a favorite corridor of invading armies and the scene of numerous famous battles. You see them in Judges chapter 4. I think I talked about one of them earlier where Sisera was sieging Jerusalem and uh, uh, um, J.L. took a nail and pinned his head to the ground. That was one of the great battles that took place there. Uh, there's uh, also in 1 Samuel 29, uh, verse 31, um, also 2 Samuel 4, verse 1, or 1 Kings uh, 9, 15. Uh, uh, there's just several battles that were fought. You can go back and look up the valleys that were fought in the valley of Megiddo. So much blood was shed in this valley of Jezreel or Megiddo that it became a, syn a synonym, I'm sorry, a synonym or synonymous for slaughter, violence, bloodshed, and, and, and battlefields, as well as a symbol for God's judgment in Hosea chapter 1, verse number 4 and 5. In our day, Armageddon also has become synonymous with a symbol for the ultimate in warfare and conflict. Almost in similar fashion, the word Waterloo has garnered a symbolic use because back in 1815, this town in Belgium was the battleground and the scene of Napoleon's final defeat. Today, we have a saying that someone or something has met their Waterloo. We don't mean they have met that city in Europe. We mean by way of a comparative imagery that they have met a decisive or crushing defeat or their enemies. I suggest Revelation employs the word for Megiddo or Megiddo in the same manner. History records that a great slaughter took place on a mountain in Palestine within the lifetime of the original recipients of the book of Revelation. In AD 70, the Roman armies of Titus totally destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. According to Eusebius, 1.1 million Jews were killed. Man, this ought to be real good news to people. The fact, first of all, that the battle of Armageddon is fought with horses ought to tell you that this had to have something to do with the first century. Because if we were to enter into a battle of Armageddon today, we certainly would not fight it with horses. We would fight it with tanks and with planes and with ground troops and with uh, uh, Humvees and every other kind of a vehicle. But what I'm showing you is that the Mount of Megiddo was the place of several battles that were fought in the valley that were symbolic of the place of slaughter so that in the mind of the Jews who would hear this terminology, they would immediately begin to think of in terms of like we would use the word Waterloo. Their Armageddon had come. Their day of slaughter had come. And the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the fulfillment of what they knew in the scriptures was about to occur. You know, even as I watched some of the stuff that was shown on uh, uh, A.D. The Bible Continues in, uh, on, that was on NBC recently. They, they talked to Caiaphas when they were about to bring the image of Caligula into the town. He said, if they set this, uh, this statue of Caligula, the emperor, up, 
and he is set up to uh, be worshipped, if this will be the abomination that maketh desolation that Daniel prophesied, and the end thereof would be with war. They understood these things. Armageddon is not in your future. Armageddon has already occurred in 70 AD. I think that's incredibly good news. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice from the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. We'll see in the next verse that lightnings, thunders, earthquakes symbolize the, what occurred on Mount Sinai and Hebrews 12 and symbolize the fulfillment and the removing of the old covenant. The message, it is done to be compared with the words of Jesus on the cross when he declared, it is finished. It was because of the finished work of Jesus Christ that we are no longer under the curses of the old covenant. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law as believers. We have made our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. There is none of these things should come near our dwelling. That day will not overtake us as a thief. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake, and such was not since men were on the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great uh, that... Uh, and, and so great. We're about to run out of time here. I don't want to just rush it and get in, but I've got to, I'm going to share some things in the next couple, uh, or just the next segment. I think we've got at least one more to deal with. But I really trust that you can see the possibility that we have given historic possibility, scriptural possibility, uh, contextual possibility to these things having all been fulfilled during the first century church and stayed consistent with Jesus' time-restricting uh, comments when he said these things are about to shortly come to pass in Revelation chapter 1 and don't seal up the words of the vision of this prophecy in the end of this book for the time was at hand. It was at hand. It came upon them. It's not in our future. It's in our past. That's incredibly good news. I trust you're being encouraged. Take a moment to call the number on the screen if you need prayer or anything someone is standing by. Uh, please consider becoming a partner with us. We, we, we really uh, thank you for your cards, letters, and help. Uh, um, our program nowhere near supports itself through the contributions of our television audience, uh, and we really need that to pick up. So if you've been watching and God has been laying us on your heart, please just simply be obedient to the Lord, and I believe God will bless you for it, and it will continue to empower us to take the gospel around the world. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.